Firstly, uh, uh, some misconceptions surrounding uh, this, what well, maybe the world thinks of it, maybe what other uh, churches may say about this place. And then we'll look at the reality of how as well. So they're the two points that I'm going to make uh, as we go through this. It's going to be um, a bit of information. So if you've got a pen, jot some stuff down. Uh, anything you want to kind of talk to me about, about uh, as well. Um, you, you can do as well. So we'll go ahead. We'll, we'll start off with a word of prayer. And then we'll get into this topic. So keep your fingers on Matthew chapter 22. We'll go for Lord. Father, we do thank you for this time that we can gather together, Lord. We thank you for the hymns that we um, have just sung, Lord. And we do pray that it was a sweet smelling savour unto thee, Lord, as we um, praise you with our lips, Lord. Lord. Um, but now it's uh, time to, I suppose, wind them down and, and just be ready for whatever you have to say to us, Lord. I know this is a, um, I suppose, sensitive uh, topic, Lord. We all know and can think of someone in our lives that maybe. Um, going towards there at, at this moment, Lord. Uh, we praise and we serve a God that, uh, that, that can change any heart and hearts, Lord. And, and sometimes we may think uh, that that person's heart is too hard to, to turn. Uh, but Lord, we, again, like I said, we, we serve a God that, that changes lives, Lord, and changes even the hardest of hearts, Lord. And so I just uh, pray that, uh, Lord, that uh, you'd, you'd uh, be with us, Lord, as, as we go through uh, this topic and, and that you'd... Uh, uh, just continue to be glorified and honoured in everything we say and we can do. Lord, um, help us to keep on looking for you and uh, to keep on looking for your will in our lives, whatever that may be. Lord. So again, we thank you and pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Right, uh, so um, as we looked into this particular story, we, and as um, uh, Shane uh, read out, uh, uh, we, there's, there's some good news, right? So the good news is that God wants you to come to this wedding feast. Right, in fact, technically speaking, God invites you to be the bride. Right? So, just a quick look, so this may take a while, just a quick uh, look into Ephesians. Uh, go to Ephesians uh, chapter 5. And we won't go into this uh, particular aspect too much, but uh, it's not that you're coming to the wedding feast. You are actually going to be a bride. If you're here, you know the Lord Jesus as Saviour. You're going to be the bride of Christ. All right? And um, in Ephesians chapter 5, when it was talking about um, tips for the husbands and wives, not that we're looking at that aspect of it, but as we look into it, uh, in verses 22 to 27, it says, Their wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. I didn't really need to read that. To make my point, but I thought I would anyway. Um, 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Um, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ love, also loved the church and gave himself uh, for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water, uh, by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So as Christians, as part of the church, we are part of the bride of Christ. All right, We are the bride, he is the head. Okay, so, we sh uh, so this marriage feast that we're talking about, we're not just part of the party, we're in, we are the bride itself. If you're saved and you know Lord uh, Jesus as Lord and you know Jesus as Saviour, uh, you'll be part of the wedding feast as the bride. And now uh, in verse 32, it, it continues on and says, This is a great mystery, but I, could, I speak concerning Christ and the church. Okay, the church isn't this building. The church isn't uh, a big, tall building that people go to on day to day. You are the church, right? If you know Jesus, you are the church, okay? We come together here locally and, uh, and serve and praise the Lord together. But if you're saved, you're part of that church. If you go back to um, uh, Matthew chapter 22, 
Matthew chapter 22. So the good news is that God wants you to be part of this, uh, invites you to be a part of this uh, wedding feast. And we see the main problem is the response of the people. The response of the people. And in verse 5, so they were invited to this wedding feast. And in verse 5 we see their response, but they made light of it. And went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. Uh, and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Okay, so from, before we carry on with this, I just want you to know that this is a parable. And so a parable is a way for Jesus to explain something through a story which has a spiritual application for them um, and that has a specific point that he wants to get across. Right? So if you go ahead and you try and nip at every single part of the story, okay, doctrinally, doctrinally, you're going to get your head all over all over source, all right? So get the point of the message and, um, and take, take that away. But we see, the, um, we see the response of the people that they made light of it, right? I've got no time. I've got no time to come this, uh, to this wedding. I've got no time, right? And that sounds awfully, well, a lot like the world, right? When people invite, when you invite them to church, when you invite them, when you talk to them about Jesus, I've got no time, right? I've got things to do. I've got all these things to do. All right? No time for God. And yet, um, yeah, yeah, so it sounds like today, but it also goes a step further. And in verse 6 it says there, And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully. You know the good things that you do for the Bible, for the Bible's sake? It's slowly kind of turning. To be a goody two-shoes uh, used to be, you know, the right thing to do. Now it's... Mm, Frowned upon, looked down upon. You're treated different. You're treated differently. And uh, then Christ warned it. You know, if you are suffering, you're not suffering because of you. You're suffering because of me. All right. That is, is, is because people they live in darkness. I have no time. And that's why God's punishment for ignoring God's gracious gift. Is the same for today. This is, this is what Jesus says. If you refuse to ask him to forgive you of your sins, God's got something better for you. He's got something better for the world. right? He's got heaven. He's got a place. He's got a mansion waiting for them. But if you don't want it, then that's your own choosing. Now the text reads in um, verse 13, if you uh, could uh, look at me with me there, it says there, And the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him there. There shall be weeping and um, excuse me, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because that's how holy God is. We serve a holy God. And he warns us of this. God warns us of this. He doesn't mess around with sin. Right? He doesn't. Alright, sin is sin. And he doesn't, he, he doesn't mess around with it. So as we look at the misconceptions, I want you to be thinking about this thought through your head that God doesn't mess with sin. And it's clear as we go through this and as we look at this doctrine of hell. Alright, so the first misconception of hell, so misconception is, is um, something that people believe about hell, but it's not scriptural. And the first one is universalism. I have to try and remember to say that properly. Universalism, universalism. Okay. Universalism, right? I get tongue-tied with them, and I've been getting tongue-tied with this word. But this, this is the teaching um, that everyone will go to heaven regardless of whatever you believe. All right, Whatever you believe, whatever actions you have, whatever religion you are in, um, there's no hell. Right? Everyone's going to go to heaven because there's no, there's no hell, right? And a few years ago, uh, there's a missionary that is on our billboard that uh, we uh, had a look at, Jeremy Panero. He came in and he was um, uh, trying to raise support for going to Vanuatu. And then he came out um, 
we went into town and, and, and started uh, passing our tracks and that sort of thing. And there was a bunch of, uh, bunch of people that were, were there and we were talking to them. I think oh, I don't waste my time too much with um, talking to people that think that they know everything, but maybe I should. So, not that that's a good thing, all right? But Jeremy spent pretty much the whole time with them. And, uh, and that's what they believe, that, 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 that there is no hell. And they're out there evangelizing that there was no hell. But if that was the case, if there is no hell, why would they need to be there? Why did they need to go into town to tell everyone that there is no hell, if there is no hell? Now, um, over in Matthew, if you can turn with me there, Matthew chapter 8, 28. Uh, so we're not too far away. Keep a finger uh, where you're at. It says there uh, in verse 19, uh, part of the Great Commission, it says there, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing uh, them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And Mark chapter 16, verse 15, uh, reads there, And he saith unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So if hell's not true, why do we need to preach the gospel to every creature? Acts chapter 8 verse, uh, 1 verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and, and Samaria and unto the uttermost, post, <laughs> uttermost part of the earth. So if there's no hell, why do we need to evangelize? Why do we need to go out and preach the gospel? What does the gospel say from? If there was no hell, wouldn't Satan himself be saved? You see, hell's not an option, they say. But the Bible says something different. Turn over to 1 John chapter 3, please. 1 John chapter 3. Not the Gospel of John, but we've got uh, towards the end of the Bible, the 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And in chapter 3, so as we see here that, that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and verse 8 says he that committed sin is of the devil right, pretty strong statement there. for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose the son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the the devil. Now, aside, aside from all this, universalism denies the biblical teaching that there's not just one eternal place, but two. Right? When you die, you're going to go to either one of two places. Life eternal or everlasting fire, everlasting death. Uh, the second misconception we see. That battery? Right. Is that hell is temporary? Hell is temporary. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. There's a few passages in, in Matthew, so if you could, yeah, well, you've got a finger in Matthew 22, so uh, just keep your uh, finger. Put my in and around that area. Now people will somehow, some way, someday, they'll get out of hell. This is what they're, they're trying to say. Essential people believe that, believe this stance, or that have the stance that hell is temporary. They want to soften the harshness of hell. But here in the last, uh, the last night, 46... Get this. In chapter yeah, 25, verse 46, it says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Right, talking about the 
goats. Uh, but the righteous into life eternal. Right, so the hell is temporary. The third misconception of hell, you see, is annihilationism. Yeah, annihilationism. Right, so when you annihilate something, it ceases to exist. All right, no more. And this is for people that can't deny the clear teaching of the existence of hell. They soften again, they soften the harshness of God's wrath. And they respond something like this. I know that Jesus talked about hell. Yeah, he talked about hell more than heaven. But that would be way too harsh to send them and suffer on and on and on. So here's what I think God will do. I think God will just annihilate them, just wipe them from existence. And that's it. But again, the Bible teaches something different. Turn over to Revelations with me. Revelation chapter 20. Uh, verse 7. We read there, in the thousands of years expired, uh, expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations and, uh, which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog, Magog, and gather them together to battle and the number of whom is the sand of the sea. And they went up uh, on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints and uh, uh, saints about and, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Um, so Satan, the beast, and the false prophet, they weren't annihilated. And the text says, uh, the last of, of, of um, chapter 10, the last part of chapter 10 says that they all remain there forever and ever and ever. The other thing is that annihil uh, annihilation is not a punishment. Hell is a punishment. So annihilation, uh, annihilationism is not true. Uh, the next point is why doesn't God just reform? Why doesn't God uh, reform? And this sounds logical. But it misses the point because God does reform. Turn over to 2 Corinthians with me, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So why, why doesn't God just change his mind and, 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 and reform them after they die? Right? But God does reform, but the time of reformation isn't when you die. It's not even on your deathbed, as some, some, as some do. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 2, we read there, the urgency there. He saith, after he saith, I have heard thee, and a time accepted, and the day of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Up this blood circulating through your body. If you're breathing. Now is the time of salvation. If you have an opportunity, you do not have to go to hell. This is the point. If you of your own doing do not want to experience God's forgiveness of your sins, if you don't want to experience His personal reformation through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, which He's provided for everyone on this planet, then God's going to honour that decision. That decision you make, God will honor. That's why in reality, God doesn't send you hell. People send themselves to hell. God wants to reach you. In fact, he's got his men out there, right? That's supposedly the Christians, right? Going out, letterboxing, going out, talking to their workmates, talking to the folk that they see from day to day. Taking some time to go out and either letterbox or go out and, and, and speak to the people in, in the streets. Right, he's got them people inviting 
people to the wedding feast. But if you don't come, God's going to honour that. But how? Isn't that a bit over the top? A bit OTT? First of all, it might sound over the top. It might sound like it's just, just an overkill. Simply because... It wasn't meant for us. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, please. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. As we kind of see part of the reason why this punishment is a little bit overkill. Now, in Matthew chapter uh, 25... Some passages are quite similar. Uh, we see a little bit more, I guess, information. It says, uh, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, unto everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So when God created hell, he didn't have you or me in mind. He had Satan in mind, a rebellious, prideful being who wanted the top job. You see, hell it wasn't designed for you and me. Uh, but the harshness reflects his wrath on Satan and his angels. Now, I've got an illustration here of a, of a, of a wood chipper. You know what those wood chippers are? You know what wood chippers are? They're those big grinding things that you can put the logs, maybe that big, into the wood chipper, and it'll start grinding, ground, ground. Right, has anyone used a wood chipper? Yeah, all right. So it's designed for putting wood in and then turning it into mulch, I think they call it, or something, right? But it turns the, um, the, the log into little bits and pieces, right? And no one cares if you chuck a log in there, that's what it's designed to do. But imagine if little Sophie or Lockie started walking towards there, what would you, what would you do? Hey, hey, get back here, Lockie. What are you doing? Don't walk that way. Sophie, don't go that way. Right? It's not designed for humans. Right? It's designed for logs. But what does the wood chipper do if all of a sudden there was a human stuck? Does it stop? Does it discriminate? It just keeps on going and crunching and crunching. Right? If you were nearby, what would you be doing? Stop! Stop! Put the kill switch on! Right? And this is not a message to get at you to go out and, and, and to, to, to preach the gospel and to go out and to uh, save as many people as possible. Okay? So it's, the, the message isn't designed for you to go out and do that. Okay? Yeah, there should, should be an urgency. And yeah, there, you should have a fire in your belly to, to, to want to do that. But this, that should come from God. Right, it shouldn't. Well, and if it comes through this message, then praise the Lord. But it should be coming through your relationship with God anyway. Right, as you read the Word, as you study the Word, as you pray to God, as you think about those who's who's, who's lost. All right, it should come through anyway. And um, but uh, that's what hell was. That's what hell was. Hell was designed for the devil and his angels. And maybe you might be thinking, oh, well, well, what's that got to do with men? This eternal damnation is far too over the top. And that, again, may sound logical to our point of view. But that's the problem with, with thinking on our point of view. You see, we serve a God, and we're going to try and understand, well, we don't really need to try and understand, but I want to put forward to you, uh, I suppose, God's, point of view on how we are to him. So this is God. He's, he's God Almighty. He stands. He's created the universe. He's the creator of all things. And he looks at the stars and he says, shine this way. And I want you to move around the planets in a certain way. Uh, or all the planets to go around the sun and, and, and everything. And that's exactly how I want you to do it until I give you another word. And guess what they do? They obey. And then as he's creating the world, I want to make the formations of the world, 
and um, I, I want the mountains to, to rise up and stop there. I want the valleys to go down and stop there. Mountains be lifted up, valleys be cast down, and they are bound. And the tides, the seas, he's going, and then the seas, and they're, they're, they're coming in, and, he's, and the, the, the tides coming in, and he says, he says to the seas, no, that's as far as I want you to come. And then they stop, and they recede, as far as he wants. And they obey him. The winds and the waves obey. And then he looks at you, and then he goes to you, come. And what do you say? No. No. I'm right, thanks. And you think he's supposed to bow down to you, oh, this is too harsh? From God's point of view, our wickedness is rebellious. Everything in this universe obeys him. Everything. Except us and the demons. Us and Satan. How has to exist as long as there's a righteous, eternal God. Next point. It's already here. It's here on earth. We're just in one big party. Those who make the statement probably haven't read the Bible, I imagine. All right? How was on earth? And if they have, they certainly don't believe it. They haven't studied the topic of hell. Now, um, in the Satanic Bible, it's, it's written, since man's natural instinct lead him to sin, all men are sinners, all sinners go to hell. If everyone goes to hell, then you'll meet all your friends there. Open wide the gates of hell and come forth to the abyss to greet me as your brother and as your friend. Now, this is the world thinking. And you may be thinking, oh, who reads that anyway? And as I looked, uh, as I looked into uh, this, there was a scene uh, at a rock concert by a rock star. Um, uh, popular, very, very, very popular. And you may have heard, heard this uh, particular um, interview, I guess. And there were hordes of people, tons of people. And they were cheering, they were going crazy. And this guy was talking about how... Do you think he was warning him about it? Do you think he was preaching the gospel of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ that he's the only way to avoid this awful, terrible place? He didn't. Right? This is what he says. Okay, minus the profanities. Right? I'll beat them out. Or I won't say at all. If that's the case, hell's going to be a really crowded place. And I'll be there. And we'll have a good time. This is where we're at with the world. With, with, with the world. With the secular world. Satan's got a real stronghold in the music world. And this is what people truly believe. That it's just going to be a big, big party. And they're kind of saying, oh, only, only the, the Christians, only the goody two-shoes, uh, uh, they're, they're going to go to heaven. The cool rebellious people, they're in hell. They're parting it up in hell. And this is their thinking. A couple more misconceptions as we uh, go on to the next point. Uh, only the rotten go there. Yeah, Hitler's going to go there. Or maybe that grown man who, who abuses his, his, his kid. Maybe that five-year-old, or maybe that brown man who just chucked his kids in, the, in, the, in a washing machine. As for me, am I going there? Nah. Nah, I'm way better than those fellas. And this is one of the biggest lies from Satan himself. Uh, if you turn with me to John, please. John chapter 40, uh, chapter 8. Okay, so we're going to see the, uh, the teaching that there are two types of people. Just as we've seen in Matthew that there's two eternal places, uh, there are two types of people. One who are in Christ and who are headed for eternal life, and the rest who are headed to 
an eternal death. There is no middle ground. You either belong to God or you belong to the devil. In um, John chapter 8, verses 42, uh, we read there, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I um, proceeded forth and came from God, neither came out of myself, but he sent me. Uh, why, do you, why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. We either belong to God or we belong to the devil. There's no middle ground. Turn over to Matthew chapter 7. One thing you will um, see clearly from the Bible is that we are all considered rotten in the eyes of God. So you must say that only the rotten go there. So Satan's the father of lies and uh, he has a, a ton of people duped that there is some mystical, magical uh, middle road. Oh, no, I'm, not, I'm not like that. those guys who go to church every week. Those, those guys, well, I suppose people next door think, oh, every week, every Wednesday, they're going there. I'm not like those guys. But I'm also not like the Satanists who's burning crosses. I think I'll stick to this middle road. I haven't made up my mind, so I'll just stick here. Over in uh, Matthew chapter 7. It says in verse 13, Enter ye the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Right, there's a big wide road that many are following. And in verse 14, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way. I've heard this um, being called, the, uh, I suppose, the difficult road. It's not difficult. All right, it's narrow. All right, it's easy to get on the narrow road. All right, God provided an easy way through the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, it's a narrow way which leadeth unto life, but few be be that find it. The middle road lie is a pretty uh, good trick of the devil, uh, but the next one is probably the biggest one that he's, he's given, is that a God of love wouldn't do it. A God of love wouldn't create a place called hell. And this is the main false teaching which filters down to the rest of the uh, others, other points that have been made. People say that my God, a God of love, wouldn't send people to hell. And even though this may sound wonderful and, 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 and people might be duped to uh, believe in it, it's simply unbiblical. And it's because God is good and it's because he's loving that he must judge and punish wicked. Otherwise, he could not be good. He could not be loving. Now, in this court situation... If someone, uh, if someone commits murder and is found guilty, do you think it's a good, loving judge would set them free? No, if a judge set them free, you'd describe that judge as corrupt. You wouldn't describe that the judge as good and loving. Think of the outcry that would go on if he just started setting people free. And the same way with God. would be good if a loving God would allow rape, murder, torture. Say to them, hey, no big deal. Come on in. You're all getting in here. Would be a good, loving God if he said to Hitler, come into heaven, along with everyone else. Don't worry about answering for your crimes. You're good. Maybe those parents that beat and kill their children, their helpless toddlers, you know, would it be good for God to just let him in? Scot free. No, he's good and he's loving because he must judge all. But he's also provided a way out for every single one of us. And that's what the cross is all about. 
He didn't come to save you from an average life. He didn't come to save you from, uh, from being poor. He came to save you from the pits of hell. And the other side of the coin is that you gain heaven as well. You gain a body. You gain streets of gold. But that's because God is good. Uh, you can put up any misconceptions you like. But if you're going to be true to the word of God, if you're going to be true to Jesus Christ and his words, unless you want to call him a liar, which I'd suggest you wouldn't do, then you must admit the necessity of hell. And that comes to our next point, which is the reality of hell. The reality of hell. Um, so what makes hell... Are so horrible is not just the necessity of it, but also the reality of it. It's the worst place that you could dream of it, or that you could dream of, but it's not a dream. Right? It's your worst nightmare. On and on and on and on forever. That's no wonder why Christ spoke about it more than heaven. And it makes sense. If God loved us, then of course he'd warn us about it. Does Jesus warn us of such a place? Let's go through a few of these verses. Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 22. Matthew 25, verse uh, 22. It says here, But I say unto you, uh, that whatsoever is angry, uh, that whosoever is angry with uh, his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever shall say uh, to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But uh, whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Drop down to verse 29 then. And if I write, I offend, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the, the whole body should be cast into hell. Flick over to 10. 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body, a soul and body in hell. 23, Matthew chapter 23. A couple of passages there. And verse 15. A woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. In Matthew 33, it says, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And then Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke chapter 12. Verse 5, there we go, it says, But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which he, after he hath killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear ye him. Fear him, sir. This is not a game. And I'm not making this up. If you're going to believe Jesus and all these quotes was by Jesus when he talks about heaven, then you better believe him when he talks about hell. And how sad that Jesus, out of love, warned you about hell. And people ignore him. But what's worse than non-Christians not believing in hell? And that's expected. Non-Christians not believing in hell. I used to be one. Didn't want to believe in hell. But what's worse that, than that is when... So-called Christians refuse to believe that there's a place called hell. But you better believe that there is this place. Not only does Jesus warn us of it, but he gives a bit of insight to it. And we'll have a look at this insight. We'll, uh, 
uh, go through a, a few of these uh, uh, passages as we looked uh, as we've uh, turned and look at some character characteristics of hell. So we're looking at the reality of hell. So in terms of biblical um, places, there's many places that Jesus talks about um, about hell. Uh, but here, here are some uh, characteristics 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 of hell. Second Peter chapter two verses four to six. Uh, if you can keep up and do so, but I'll just uh, read out these passages as I turn to them. But uh, first of all, it's a place of uh, wicked people and demons. So in 2 Peter verses 2 verses 4 uh, to 6. That's First Peter, so that's not going to work. Alright, it says, if, uh, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into uh, to chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them as an example unto those that after should live and godly. Uh, we'll go with the place of everlasting punishment. We did see that um, before. Okay, so there's um, everlasting punishment. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 29. We'll turn there. A place of eternal damnation. Put these all up, eh? Chapter 3, verse 29. Uh, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath, uh, hath never forgiveness, but is danger of eternal damnation. Uh, place of everlasting uh, destruction. So that's in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. This in chapter 1, verses 7 to 9, it reads here, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore, oh, sorry, yeah, no, that was verse 9 that I read. Uh, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? Okay, so I was supposed to start at verse 7. Uh, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his almighty angels and flame, uh, flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that obey not the gospel. Those are the folk that will be um, described in mind who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Uh, uh, and then we've got the um, place of all the weeping and gnashing of teeth. We also got the place of outer darkness. All right. So in Matthew chapter eight verse twelve, it says there, "But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth." And in Jude chapter one verse thirteen, or verse thirteen, raging waves of the sea foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of the darkness. Forever, and then we've got uh, the place of fire. So we've got uh, a whole heap of um, descriptions. So place of darkness, uh, place of fire. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter twenty. Earlier. But in verse 10, as we read before, it's a place of torments. Right? At the end there it says, and shall be tormented night, a day and night forever. That's the place of fire and the place of the lake of fire. And verses 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Uh, the place of worms and a place of unquenchable fire. All right, Mark chapter 9, verse 48. It reads there. Uh, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Uh, one more passage, really, to turn to. to turn over to uh, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. As we see, also it's a place of torment. So we've got a place of outer darkness, with darkness, a place of fire, and a place of torment. So we can see uh, uh, eternal torment in uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And yeah, you know, I'll read this passage uh, from 23 to 31. It says there, and how he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and saith Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and said Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us is a great gulf fixed, uh, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither they can pass to us that would come from thence. And they said, I pray therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto them, They have Moses and the prophets led him. Then, hear them. And he said, Nay, Father, for if one went unto them from the dead, they would repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not, know Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. No one rose from the dead. So there's a, a place of thirst. Okay, so there's a place of torment. A place of thirst. All he wanted was just a drip from his finger, from the water. Second, we see it's a place of no return. Right? There's a great gulf fixed in this particular case that they would not pass from hence to you. A place of remembrance. This might be the, big, like, the biggest one for, for anyone, I imagine. That they remember what their life was like. That they remember every opportunity that they had. That someone talked to them about the gospel. Yeah, I think I was warning me about it. But just too prideful. They just didn't listen. The amount of times that they got preached the gospel. And they're going to remember. Day and night. And in verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 25, he says here. Remember that thou in thy lifetime receives the good things. And that's what they might remember, the good life that they had, but not worth it. Not worth the torments that they've gone through. Not worth the torment that he's gone through now. And a place of torment. And it's interesting, um, at the end there, he said, look, look, I want you to send um, Lazarus, I want, I want you to uh, send him. Send them that, so that they'll believe them. But if not, they're not going to believe. If they're not going to believe Moses and the prophets, if they're not going to believe the word of God, they're not going to believe if someone comes from the dead. They've already made up their mind. How many lost souls are in hell screaming for every Christian on this earth to tell their loved ones about this wretched place? These, these lost souls are like the rich man, desperately wanting you to preach Jesus. Let's, um, let's struggle together. For this in mind, uh, here's a description, I, I suppose, of how. It's a picture of time. 
that continues to tumble on forever and ever. All right? Could be both hell, could be both heaven. Either heaven or hell. But then it's never ending, never slowing down. The same years and decades of torment and of sorrow, pain, blankets of darkness, nights never ending, constant consciousness. You're awake, you're alive that whole time, always thinking about those regret and sorrow. Um, never ending, nights never ending, lostness, aloneness, loneliness, rumblings from the pit, groans, torturing fires, choking smells, unending and unending, no letting up, no relief, no comfort, never resting, never ceasing, never relenting, and there's no end in sight. And you're going through a hundred years. And then that turns to thousands of years. Millions of years. The same grinding pain. <coughs> agony. Screams upon screams. Weeping and weeping. And echoing sighs upon sighs. So as we um, I think back to the parable. Where do you, where do you fit? Where do you fit in the wedding feast? Are you even going? Are you going to this wedding feast? Would be the first question, I guess. Because God invites every single one of us to be part of that pride, uh, the bride of Christ. And all you have to do is accept that invitation. Don't make any excuses. Don't be too busy. Uh, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you haven't appropriated the work that he's done on that cross for you, then don't leave this place until you've sorted that first and foremost. Don't be too busy, otherwise this might be another regret that you remember in the depths of hell. Maybe you are going to that feast. Are you doing all the work that the king commands you? Are you going out and inviting both good and bad to the wedding feast? And as Christians, that's part of our job. Right. And again, my encouragement to you wouldn't be to go out and do it. My encouragement to you would be to make sure you're right with God. Because it's the Holy Spirit that will drive you. Not anything I say, but the Holy Spirit will drive you. And your relationship with God, that should be the driving force of you going out to preach the gospel. And maybe God has um, spoken to you and he's uh, uh, given you a passion to seek, to say that which is locked. Maybe he's given you a passion to, um, to preach. Maybe there's something in this ministry that, uh, that you see that there's a gap um, that you could do. Again, if God's putting that, a thought in front of your mind, uh, then, then come see me, come see us about it. And uh, we'll point you in the right direction. Uh, so um, that's me. That's all I've got for uh, this uh, morning. Um, take something away from you today. If there's a challenge that you needed, um, then uh, don't leave this place uh, until you sort it out with God. If, you, if you're not right with God, if there's something that you need to do, if there's something in your life that's kind of dragging you behind, then this is the place to be to sort your things out, right, with God. All right, get right with God. Uh, if you're not right with God in the first place, if you don't know you're going to heaven when you die, then please come see me after the service and um, we'll have a yarn and, and see where you're spiritual. Um, it was spir spiritually, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and we'll close in a word of prayer. And then I'll ask you to come on up. Father, we do thank you for this time that we can gather together. Lord, I thank you for um, being able to, uh, uh, for the work that you did on the cross 2,000 years ago. Lord, that's certainly uh, saved us from hell. And uh, Lord, it's, it is an awful, terrible place, Lord, as, as described in, in your word. And Lord, help us to, to know the reality of it, Lord. But more than that, help us to draw closer to you, Lord, uh, that as we read your word, as we read what you say uh, about hell, because Lord, uh, by no means we, we only really touch the surface in terms of biblically known about uh, hell. Help us to learn more about it, that we know to, uh, what to say to, to people and that uh, we can uh, just draw closer to you and, and to continue to grow in you, Lord. 
Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as Lord and Saviour, Lord, I do pray that you'll prick their hearts, Lord, that they will leave this place until uh, they, they made the decision uh, to come into the, to your family, Lord, uh, and to be a, a part of uh, the uh, of God's family, Lord. So again, we just uh, pray that you build that situation, those that may be in that situation as well, Lord. Uh, so, Lord, uh, be with us for uh, the rest of this day, the rest of this week, Lord. Help us to glorify you in everything we say, everything we think, everything we do. We're going to thank you for these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.